Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from actually a rainy San Diego today, which is normally it's a sunny San Diego. Today it's a rainy San Diego. And I'm joined by Libby Gill, who's just up the road in Los Angeles. And I'm assuming it's raining there too. You got it. <laughs> Excellent. And what we're going to we're going to talk to Libya about today is the book uh, that she had. Uh, it's, it's a co-author of, which is called Leadership Reckoning: Can Higher Education Develop Le the Leaders We Need? And this is a really interesting. It's a very interesting subject because obviously there's a lot of focus in today on education. There's a lot of stuff in the news, um, but we're also going through massive change because of the pandemic. We were going through massive change anyway, and while universities are great at like turning out people with you know specialist degrees in areas or whatever uh, i don't think anyone would argue that universities and colleges turn out great leaders or prepare people for leadership in the way that they should so first off um Libby, give me a little bit of background to why this book was important in the first place. Sure. And I will tell you, my co-authors and I will argue that colleges don't necessarily turn out leaders uh, based mm -hmm. on the research. But, but there is a, a program at Rice University in Houston, yeah. and it was found, the, the, there's a program there called the Door Institute for New Leaders. John Doerr, as you probably know, John is the head of the venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins. And John and his wife, Ann Doerr, are both philanthropists, very wealthy people. They're up there in that top 10 of the U.S. most wealthy people. And they both happen to be engineering grads from Rice. And thinking that there just aren't enough leaders, what, what's happening to leadership in our country, in business, in different areas of, of, of our world, they felt that they wanted to do something productive. They had started an engineering leadership program at Rice, and then they decided they would start a leadership development, not tied to any specific discipline. And they brought in a, a former brigadier general who also happened to be a leadership expert and teacher from uh, Yale and West Point named Tom Kolditz, Dr. Thomas Kolditz. And he founded this Door Institute. Mm -hmm. And I was brought in about three years later when they decided this is working, let us codify this into a book. And I had the great privilege of writing it alongside Dr. Kolditz and also Dr. Ryan Brown, who is their measurement and metrics person. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's fascinating. I have uh, talked to uh, somebody from, from, that, uh, from that program before, but, and, and it's a fantastic program. So here's the thing, here's the thing, Libby, is um, so leadership, number one, there's leadership and there's management, right? And that often gets confused. And yes. then there's, and then there's just leadership in a, in a changing world uh, where you have to motivate and bring people with you. And, and the reality is, and let's be honest, that a lot of people default into leadership positions and mm -hmm. Um, or they're or they're promoted into leadership positions, but often they're promoted. People are promoted into leadership positions without having any idea of what it takes to be a leader, or because they were very good at the job, and then they say, "Okay, Libby, you're fantastic at this job, so we're just going to make you the leader of all of these people and everything." But we're not going to actually invest in you. And um, to your point, you can go to college, but you, we don't address any of those issues there. No, and the thing about the book was, as, as the co-authors were looking around and forming this institute, they really felt like people needed to be developed, not as leaders in engineering or leaders mm -hmm. in fine arts, but to be leaders. And starting with young people, and what you said is, was absolutely my experience in the corporate world, is by the time you're a leader, you've either figured it out or you have not. And, and even as an executive coach, I'm typically brought in at about the vice president and up range. Mm. So they looked around and did their homework and, and serious research on what a lot of the institutions, including the Ivies and the top level universities were claiming they were doing and whether or not they were in fact turning out leaders or even measuring the outcomes of the leadership programs they had. And we found, oh, and I, this was pre my coming into it, but, but their research really showed that there are lots of claims being made 
Uh, we stop short of saying that they're fraudulent claims, but they can mm -hmm. certainly be called misleading because, you know, things that were included were things like um, residence hall meetings or an outside business leader coming in, or let's take everybody on this ropes course team building. Mm -hmm. And those were all considered leadership efforts when in fact, they were never measured. They weren't necessarily leadership driven. They weren't part of any program. They weren't centralized within the university. So it was clear that something different needed to be done. And the beautiful thing about this book, and I was so privileged to be part of it and tons of interviewing and writing about the, what the program consists of, is that it's, it's, an op it's literally an open book. They have opened it. Here's how we did it. Here's how you can do it. They got a massive infusion of cash from the, the doors who gave $50 million to Rice University. They were not kidding around, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, in the book, we explain you don't need that sort of endowment. There are lots of things you can do to set up a meaningful leadership program. So one of the, one of the chapters you say is um, you know leading with skill, building leader competencies on the foundation of identity and emotional intelligence. Can you can you just dive into that a little? Sure. The leadership identity is simply. And this is where there's such a misconception about leadership. It is a decision to lead doesn't mean you are a leader. It means you aspire to lead. And so an 18-year-old freshman in college can say, I want to be a leader. I, by, I'm choosing to be a leader, whether they're a leader of a club or a, 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 an athletic group or whatever they are. They've said, I want to lead and I need to learn about leadership. That is the identity. We can all make that choice. So when I even talk about leadership when I'm speaking, it's at all levels. And it really is about, I'm, I'm prepared to be a leader. Next are the, 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 what people love to call soft skills, which sort of kills me. Yeah, and I hate that phrase. Yeah, it's, it's just a little outdated and it, it undervalues. Well, yeah, and, and I think to your point, it undervalues. And I think that if you do label anything soft skills, what's the first thing gonna get cut in any budget crunch? Exactly. Exactly. And yet, as you and I know, it's your technical skill, it's your sales skill, it's your mm -hmm. uh, financial, it's your legal, whatever it is that gets you to that level. And then everything above that is actually the soft skills, communication, yeah. collaboration, um, empathy for others, all of those things. And, and for the, the students and, and young leaders, it starts with self-awareness. And so learning those skills that sometimes people grapple with, you know, well into their careers, if you can learn that at 18 or 25 or you know, early in your career stage, you have such an advantage for so many years to come. Oh, my goodness. If you can address self-awareness at that early age, uh, unfortunately, some of us, and I won't name names, I, I'm, well, me, you know, it takes, it took a little bit longer. And I think self-awareness is the most incredibly important thing that undertaking you can do that that self-discovery that's self-awareness so if you can do it then i mean that really does open up a lot for you going forward of course and then you add on the specific skills that your yeah. organization needs and when you put them in a framework of leadership that at every stage of my career i am learning to lead even if it's leading myself mm -hmm. or leading with a partner or a peer and then moving up to true leadership in terms of your authority and the people underneath you where you have that sort of followership you start with those that emotional intelligence and academics will argue with the validity of emotional intelligence because they just don't think that's a, a measurable you know sort of group of skills but it's it's all those things that we're talking about like communication empathy yeah. all of those things well, what's interesting about that is they may not consider that as some immeasurable or whatever it is, whatever um, benchmarks or rubrics they use for these things. However, anybody who's been on the receiving end of people who lack emotional intelligence or in, or in leadership positions can tell you there is indeed a very measurable impact. Yes, and there are lots of ways to measure it, assessments mm -hmm. and you know, I still do 360 assessments in the in the corporate world, mm -hmm. which some companies have gotten away from. I think it's so it's so useful that John, I would give you a self assessment so you would look at your your own strengths and skills and also the areas where you need to grow. And then I talk to about a dozen people around you, above, beside, direct reports, and that's when you find out those blind spots. And people in the workplace aren't necessarily there to tell you, you know, to give you that constructive criticism. That can be a little dangerous. 
So yeah. getting that from others helps you fill that sort of emotional intelligence, the gaps and that you have. And I think it's really important and in, in, uh, in the leadership development, the really important is to really understand what these things actually mean, because I, I think sometimes people, you know, they think emotional intelligence, they think, oh, that just means that I, I, I just you know, like sympathize with you, or I can relate to you, or I'm funny or something like that. You know, a lot of people still think emotional intelligence is Southwest Airlines making jokes on their planes, being, right? Yeah, or being Which nice. Is sure or be yeah. nice, right? Or or the other or the empathy one where they think empathizing is sympathizing when it's not. It's completely different. So I think it's incredibly important that people learn not just um, not just the other parts of leadership, but they learn to understand what emotional intelligence means, what empathy means. Because here's the thing: is I could be extremely empathetic towards you, Libby, but it doesn't mean I can't deliver tough messages to you. Yeah. In fact. I should be if I do, if I need to. And if I'm empathetic enough, I should know that I need to deliver these to you. Right, right. And the interesting thing at, at Door, at Rice, they have measured the outcomes. If, if something doesn't work, it's gone. If mm -hmm. something does work, they figure out how to improve it. And it's been fascinating. And now having it open to anyone, undergrads and graduate students, now 40% of the student body goes through this program. And it's spread by word of mouth among the students. So it's, they understand the value. It's highly efficient. People take these skills with them. And it, it's really incredible to see the growth there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think uh, the other part is that uh, there, are certain, there are certain things, as we said before, that have traditionally not been taught in, in colleges and you don't come out. And yes, you, the experience is a huge part of it. So, you know, you still have to apply the principles and all of that. But what you're talking about here is really helping people avoid many of the pitfalls and mistakes. And the, let's face it, the, the leadership school of hard knocks that we probably all came up through. A lot of hard knocks uh, self-inflicted as well. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I, if there was a hard way to, to find out how to do something through my corporate career, and I was thrown into leadership very quickly, that was the way I went. Let's, let's figure out the hardest way, only to discover, oh, had I learned a little bit about this along the way, the path would have been so much easier. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping this really opens up other organizations, certainly in the academic world, but also in the business world to say, hey, why, not, why are we not investing more deeply into our young leaders and, and really letting people grow through the organization, having that good basic foundation for their own careers? Yeah, and you mentioned something earlier that I just wanted to come back to because I think it's incredibly important is that not to confuse always, oh, as we said, leadership with management, not to confuse leadership with uh, somewhere on an org chart or in a hierarchical structure, because as you said there earlier, the first and most important leadership skill is leading yourself. For sure. It's, it's understanding who you are and what you're made of and how you can grow and how you build those skills, both on the leadership development side and also on the technical and tactical side. Because you're right, it always is a blend of, of leadership and management. Mm -hmm. um, you, and you have to understand the difference. I love to think of it, and I, I don't remember where I heard or read this, but that leaders ask questions and managers answer questions. <laughs> So I kind of love that leaders are always looking out front and ahead. And one thing we found out from the students at Rice was a lot of them assumed leadership was, it was personality. And if you were yeah. aggressive and, and loud, you were gonna be a better leader. And that is so not the case. And, and that was quickly, people learned that there are many types of leadership and it's really finding your own identity and your own style. Yeah, because I mean, let's face it, I mean, we have in many ways celebrated the, the you know, the cult of, of personality, the cult of leadership, the, the gregarious, the outgoing, the, you know, charismatic or whatever and all of that. And, and the reality is that as most of us go through our careers, you don't come across that many people like that, but you come across a lot of very, very effective leaders who have all different types of personality traits. Exactly. There's, there aren't that many dynamic visionaries out there running companies. Certainly there are some, and those are the ones that get written about, but there are lots of other very effective leaders, introverted leaders, uh, leaders that default to numbers. There's, you know, there's all kinds of ways that you can bring out your own strength to be a leader. And that's, that's really what the book is about, is showing showing other people how to develop leadership programs. So it's not just how to develop leaders, it's really about how do you develop a leadership program in your institution? 
and just giving you the guidelines of how the, uh, the folks at Rice did it and uh, how you can measure it. And here are some of the resources that we used and they, we've shared it all in the book. Yeah, and, and like I said, I think this is incredibly important because we've been through such dramatic change oh, through the pandemic, but the change was happening anyway. And I think that the pace of change and the capacity for making wrong choices and wrong moves right now, I think, has grown exponentially, and those can be catastrophic. However, there's also the great opportunities to be able to pivot and move quickly when things aren't going right and actually turn it to your advantage. And these are these are the things that leaders need to think about and be prepared for. And I and that's why I think preparing people as as young as possible. And then within, as you said, within companies, developing ongoing leadership programs is incredibly important because nobody can afford to sit on their laurels. No, I agree with that. And and why wait until somebody's 20 years into their career to think about, <laughs> gee, should this person be be a leader or be trained as a leader or learn some basic concepts? Um, of course they should. So it, it, it was an interesting journey. We spent a couple of years on this. First, looking at some of the data long term and investigating other what other institutions were doing and then really codifying this program so people could say, oh, you know, I, I didn't get a huge endowment, but you know what? We can centralize leadership development. We can take it seriously. We can make it a core value, which is one of the most important things right there is to say, we are a leadership development company. No, absolutely, absolutely. Because otherwise, what will happen, as we've seen recently, is a crisis comes along, you know, the tide goes out, and we pretty much see who's wearing swimsuits and who isn't. Yeah, yeah, we saw Very that quickly. over this last year. Yeah, yeah. We won't name names because there's plenty of names to go around, but I think everybody has their own favorite choice there. Um, but I think that, but I think that in itself lays bare the fact that we put people in positions with zero leadership skills. And I think that's why any any company or person listening to this, I think is take a look at this book and take a look at what you're doing in your organization and say, okay, do we wanna leave? Do we want to develop our leadership organically? Sure, your leadership style, you can do that. Um, but um, how that develops, just like anything you do organic may not turn out the way you want. It's much right. better to be deliberate. Yeah, or a, a combination of organic mm -hmm. and deliberate. So mm -hmm. uh, that was a big part of the self-selection. People come in that want to be trained, that have that desire, that have that goal. And I think the same thing would apply in organizations. You can make everybody take that leadership development training, or you can say, you know, who wants to be a leader and find yeah. out who shows up, which is a very interesting proposition right there. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And it may surprise you. Um, well, listen, Libby, this, as always, this has been fantastic. It's called Leadership Reckoning. Can higher education, um, that's, that's the thing. Can higher education develop the leaders we need? Um, it's, it's fantastic. The work that they're doing at, at Rice is fantastic. And, um, and this, is, this is such a great book. Um, Libby, uh, before we go, please do tell people a little bit about what you do particularly. Oh, sure. Um, I'm an executive coach. That is my primary responsibility. I tend to work with leaders up at the other end of the spectrum. Sometimes those leaders we're talking about um, also work with young leaders, but I work with both executives and entrepreneurs and, and dearly love what I do. I'm, I guess there's a part of me that's fortunate that not all the leadership development has happened across the, uh, across the country because there's room left over for lots of improvement. Yeah. Well, you're you're working you're working with people at the level that uh, you know that's when they can that's when they get to be dangerous, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's where they really need the help because that's when your decisions can have you know massive Big and major impact. impact. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, thanks again, Libby, as always, uh, Libby Gill, Leadership Reckoning is the book. Also check out LibbyGill.com uh, um, for the executive coaching. I'd highly recommend you. I say this anytime we have executive coaches on is uh, really do think about coaching you for yourself because you invest in so many things, but I guarantee you don't invest very much in your own professional development or your own career. And you probably have a coach for your hobbies. I guarantee you, if you're a golfer, you probably have a <laughs> right. golf guy you go to. And no matter how decent or good you get at golf, it ain't going to put bread on your table probably. So <laughs> maybe you should invest a little bit of that time and money on, a, on an executive coach who can help you be better at, at your day job. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> all right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline and CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.